So I'm here with uh, Kevin Anderson, who's a professor of energy and climate change at the Tyndall Center for Climate Change Research at the University of Manchester. Uh, but at the moment, we're in Uppsala in Sweden. It's a cold, crispy, snowy day outside. And uh, the reason we're here is that uh, over the last eight or nine years, uh, you've been a frequent visitor to Sweden. Uh, you've been a visiting professor here at Uppsala University uh, at the Department of Earth Sciences and also uh, at CMUS, the Center for Environment and Development Studies. Uh, and we've been working closely over these past eight years um, together. And I thought we'd start uh, this chat today, which will be about the uh, current state of the climate crisis uh, with a quote uh, that you well, that you it's from an interview that you did with Nick Breeze and I have a mm. bit of a paraphrase quote here that I thought I'd read out and then we sort of have that as a backdrop to our conversation um, and this is what you said more or less <laughs> the fossil fuel industry and high energy use industries have now completely co-opted the COP process this is not about climate change anymore. It's about the incumbents maintaining power. Without removing the lobbyists, the power and the voices from poor communities will be overshadowed repeatedly by the self-interest of the wealthy countries. And of course, what you're speaking about here is the, the ongoing, actually, climate negotiations um, that are happening at the moment as we speak. I thought we'd have, so to unpick this quote a little bit and, and understand the, the, the way in which you came to express this <laughs> rather harsh um, um, criticism of, of the way in which we've addressed climate change. I thought we'd sort of turn back time a little bit and go back to the 80s, I guess, uh, because mm -hmm. before you went into, uh, into research and became a climate change researcher, you were actually working in the oil industry. Yes, I was indeed, yes. <laughs> my, uh, my dim distant and uh, slightly dark past. Yes, I, I trained as an engineer and I found myself in the end uh, working or designing and building offshore oil platforms um, in the 1980s and through to the very beginning of the 1990s. And uh, during that time is when we started to see the, the rise in the press and so forth about issues of, of climate change. Now, right from being a, a, a youngster, I, I'd been interested in issues of nature and the environment, as you might have called them then. I was brought up in a, in a rural environment. And I didn't know very much about climate change. And so I decided to, to leave the oil industry and go back to university and uh, do a master's course, postgraduate course, on, on climate change and the environment. And other than a, a short return to, to the oil and gas industry, I've pretty much been working as an academic uh, since the 90s um, through to the, till today, working on climate change. And what sort of insights has that given you in terms of the, 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 the state of the climate? And, and what, uh, yeah. what, I guess, also why climate change is such an important issue? Yeah. Or is well, it still, yeah. yeah. It, well, it was actually quite helpful having an engineering background, being in the oil and gas industry. I think gives me a, a, a certain sort of lens into the challenges that we face today, which a lot of other a lot of other academics don't have that because it's that practical background in the industry that is causing most of the problems. You know, there are combustion of oil and gas uh, and for, and coal, fossil fuels. Um, it's about seventy five percent of the warming we've seen we, we've seen so far, and that we expect to see is coming from fossil fuels. The other twenty five percent is broadly related to agriculture and food production. Very important those issues are but my focus has been on energy where it's the main cause in terms of the urgency of this i mean i am very clearly of the view that climate change is just one symptom of of contemporary society of how we have chosen to uh, to abuse our own home the planet in which we live whether that's overfishing our oceans whether it's dumping a lot of sewage and waste in the oceans um, whether it's now making the oceans more acidic from climate change, but how we've also destroyed a lot of land, how we've wiped out a lot of biodiversity from, from insects to mammals. So we're destroying our own, own home. And this has not been something that we've done over thousands of years. It's something that we've done really post-industrial revolution, most of it. And indeed, most of the damage has been done post in the 1950s and 1960s. So it's people of my generation that have decided to do this and not respond appropriately to it. And the reason I think climate change is probably there's a, there's the reason I focus on it is because I think it's of the numerous challenges we face, ecological challenges that we face, I think it's the most urgent. The time frame we have to, to deal with climate change is incredibly tight. And 
and that's really why I work in this in, in this realm, and why in fact that that quote it's, it sounds you know, really very challenging and quite depressing sometimes. But we that's that's where we are. We have to be honest about the position we're actually in today. And when you say that it's urgent, uh, how do you, how do you come to that conclusion? Well, the science gives us a, the, well a blend of the science and the policy, if you like. Mm. We've made commitments going right back to 1992, the big Rio Earth Summit, mm. that we would avoid. You know, we, as as in virtually every country that signed up to it, almost all countries in the world signed up to the to the Rio Earth Summit agreement, that we would um, reduce our emissions sufficient that we would um, avoid dangerous levels of climate change. If you roll that on for 23 years, lots more negotiations. Eventually, the Paris Agreement in 2015 said, well, what do we mean by dangerous? And it said we must be well below 2 degrees centigrade and no more than 1.5 degrees centigrade of warming compared to the pre-industrial period. That's a huge change. We've never seen in human history anything like that level of change. And this is occurring almost overnight. You know, 1.5 degrees centigrade of warming will have occurred in the next 10 years, probably. Um, 2 degrees centigrade by about 2050. If we carry on like we're going now, 3 to 4 degrees centigrade towards the end of the century. So the, the rate of change is phenomenally fast. We know we know what's causing it. We know how much um, fossil fuels uh, bring about the emissions that, that we see. And we know how rapidly we have to phase away from fossil fuels and change our agricultural practices and our diets. All of that is really clear from the science if we're to deliver on our political commitments. And it's not really the temperatures, I guess, that it's the impacts that are associated with those temperatures that you're concerned with. Yeah, of course, it, ultimately, it is the impacts. And the temp the t if the temperatures occurred over thousands or millions of years, so what? Mm. But if the temperatures are occurring as fast as they are today, ecosystems and human systems cannot evolve fast enough to deal with what's happening. Mm. And let's also be clear, those impacts are being felt today at 1.2 degrees centigrade of warming by lots of poorer communities around the world. People are dying, their communities are being destroyed, um, it's creating a lot of instability in lots of parts of the world, typically people who have very little global political influence and have had almost nothing to do with, with the problem. They've not caused the problem. So people are living with our climate change today, and it's getting worse and worse, and we are putting that now increasingly on our own children's futures in the Northern Hemisphere as well. And of course, it's not only climate change that is driving those. Uh... No, climate change exacerbates a lot of other tensions that are there. Um, and challenges that they face. But I think increasingly climate change is becoming a key driver of the challenges that they face. I mean, it's exacerbated the existing ones, but now I think it's increasingly becoming a key driver. So since the early 90s then, when we started uh, negotiating and discussing these issues at the international level, how have we've been doing and yeah, we start with the, start the yeah well if you looked at our um, school record for the international community you might say that uh, um, yeah, attainment would be would be e minus um, but our ability to change would probably be about an a you know we have all we have everything we we need at our fingertips to make the changes but we have chosen and the we there is very important it's yeah. those of us who frame the debate those of us who are responsible for most of the emissions we have chosen to do nothing about climate change so today this year, emissions will be about 60% higher than they were in 1992 at the time of the Rio Earth Summit, 60% higher. We've emitted more carbon dioxide since then than we, admitted, than we emitted in all of human history up to that point. Emissions this year will be higher than they were last year. So the signs are not good at the moment. Um, you know, our report card, as I say, you know, we have absolutely failed to address climate change. Despite all the rhetoric, all the wonderful speeches, all of these big events that we have every year, we have failed to address climate change. And when you say we, there, would you like to be more specific? Well, <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, some of the data is really clear on this, that half of, half of global emissions come from just 10% of the population. I think even more damning um, that the top 1% of global emitters are responsible for twice the amount of carbon as the bottom half of the world's population. So the inequality in who's causing the emissions, I think is, I would use the language of obscene. And that's what it is. But who is framing the debate? Most of the people framing the debate are in the top 1%. Um, and so we do not really want to change the, the business as usual storyline that we have done very well out of. So and quite a few of the people are gathering at COP. This week. Almost all the senior people gathering at COP yeah. will be in that group, yes. And in terms of looking into the future, then, what this, the, the commitments that we signed up to in Paris, what would that actually entail then, mm. if we look at the, what the science is telling us and also the political commitments okay, yeah. together? Well, we have to eliminate fossil fuel use from 1.5 degrees centigrade. 
at a global level, we have to eliminate all fossil fuel use by 2040 at the very latest. But given that we've signed up in every agreement to, to abide by the concept of equity, then, and, and that has been very clear in all the agreements, that means that the poorer parts of the world have longer to move away from fossil fuels and the richer countries have to lead on that. For 1.5 degrees centigrade, it means for wealthy countries that we need to be zero emissions, zero fossil fuel use by about 2030. 2030. Now, as I say, globally, it may be nearer 2040. For two degrees centigrade, we have about another decade at most on that. So incredibly tight timeframes for the wealthy parts of the world. And the poorer countries also have to you know, not lock themselves into fossil fuels, um, but also phase out the fossil fuels that they're using today. So the time frame is incredibly tight. Um, but what that means for us, clearly from the science, is that there are two elements to that. One is we have the technologies to rapidly transition away from fossil fuels. We have to phase the fossil fuels down, you have to, uh, uh, out, you have to eliminate them altogether from the system. But we have the technologies to allow us to have plenty of energy still to live good quality lives. We have the energy in terms of generating power, but we also in terms of using much less power for our transport, for our heating, for all of those things. So the technologies are there to do what we need to do today. But in, in themselves, they are now insufficient. We also require deep social change. And that's been, very made, been made very clear in some of the statements from Working Group 2 of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. We have to ask fundamental questions about power, about our social values, about our economics. It makes this very clear within that, within that um, part of the IPCC. And so you have to align those two things to do together, the social change, fairness and equity with the technologies. You put those together and we've got a slim chance of staying within the commitments we made at the Paris Agreement. Do you also see that statement from the second working group of the IPCC, do you also see that as a prerequisite in some sense for not exasperating other environmental and social issues when trying to phase out fossil fuels? Because I think that's one of the concerns sometimes is that, well, to actually deliver on yeah. these commitments, what will that do to other um, things that we care about? <laughs> yeah, I mean, this is a systemic challenge. So just focusing on climate change and just thinking it as some sort of technocratic solution, mm -hmm. where then we will exacerbate other challenges that we face. Climate change has to be seen as one of a suite of challenges that we face. You, can't, you must see it. Or it's a symptom. Yeah. It's a symptom of contemporary society, how we've run contemporary society. Um, and so yeah, we have to be very careful when we respond to climate change. We're not exacerbating the other ones that are there. And ideally, we want to try and respond to all of these challenges at the same time. And there are a lot of crossovers between them, but there are also real risks that sometimes you, you solve one thing and cause another. Now, in contemporary society, we have been very good at reductionist thinking of, of silos, of thinking one bit and then causing another problem elsewhere. It, we, we don't have that opportunity anymore. We have to start to think of these issues at a system level. And, and what would that look like then in terms of uh, these deadlines that we have if, if we were actually to stay within those carbon budgets that, 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 we, uh, that the science is telling us and that we signed up to in Paris, what would, just to give a little bit of flavor of, of, of uh, what that would look like in a country like the UK that you're from or in Sweden? Okay, well, it, it would mean major changes to all the key parts of our lives that, where we use lots of fossil fuels. So whether that's heating our homes, running our industries, our transport systems. And some of that can be dealt with with technology. But so, for instance, on transport, one that you know, most people are quite familiar with, almost all wealthy countries now is dominated by the car. It's not about moving people. It's about moving lumps of metal around with one person in them. You'd have to move away from that. I mean, the, it's not to say you wouldn't have some cars, but this idea that everyone owns their or aspires to owning their own car. And that's how you move, in my case, 85 kilograms of me from one place to another that would not be viable. We would have to have active transport and public transport in introduced very rapidly indeed. That's not to say you wouldn't have some EVs, but probably not everyone, electric vehicles, not everyone would be owning these. We'd have to massively reduce how often we fly, but who flies? It's generally the wealthy who are, who are driving the flying, not you know, the average people don't fly very often. Um, when it comes to energy production, we'd have to phase out fossil fuel use very rapidly indeed, but we have plenty of alternatives to that already that are very low carbon, that are actually often cheaper than fossil fuels. We should be building those incredibly rapidly. So the scale of challenge here technically is all doable, but it does mean a fundamental sort of rewriting in, in how we use our labour and our resources in modern societies. But all of that now, we've left it so late, won't work unless we address the, the fairness issue as well. Within so countries. Within countries as well as between countries. Yeah. You know, um, as I say, most of the emissions are just, uh, just come from a very small proportion of the world's population. 
And what you're telling us now, or what, you, what you're sort of painting out here, why is that not something that's spoken more often about in sort of academic debates or in the public debate, in that, for that matter? So, so why don't we hear this message more from researchers yeah. and from the media? I mean, there are lots of reasons for that, but the, the, the key reason is that the people framing the debate are in the top 1%. Mm. We've done very well out of business as usual. We don't want to rock the boat. And so whether it's the, um, the policymakers, the CEOs of our companies and the senior managers, whether it's the, uh, the senior academics and the professors, the editors or the owners of the newspapers and the editors of the newspapers, we're all in that group. So we don't want to, we don't want to really you know, shake up how well we've done. So, um, and not only that, but we, of course, fund the research. So there's a whole sort of um, momentum behind maintaining the status quo, even though our commitments and our science tells us that that isn't viable. So we, we need to be shaken out of that very comfortable zone that we're in, that the, 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 the COP, that, that quote you, that you read out at the beginning, that feeds into. I mean, the COP is there to maintain the current power relationships. A few people from the poor parts of the world are allowed to have come and, they, they, you know, we, we hear them, we don't listen to them, we hear them. Well, what, who we listen to are the oil lobbyists that are there in great, with greater representation than any of the negotiators from the countries of the world. So... So we are listening to particular groups who are interested in maintaining the status quo at these big events. We have to remove them from these events and from our negotiations and from our wider thinking on climate change mm -hmm. if we are going to respond to the challenges that we face. And who, who should remove them then? And I'm thinking of sort of the role of civil society here mm -hmm. also. What, what do you, how do you see that coming in and how that relates to the yeah. work that you've been doing? Well, I'm going to put on the record that I would like to thank civil society very much over, over the last five, six, seven years, that it has pushed an agenda that is much more in line with what our commitments say is required and what our science has told us. So the scientists have done a fantastic job in understanding climate science, understanding how the climate works. What we have fundamentally failed on as experts, as professors, as academics, is to translate that into what that means for modern society. Civil society is pushing us really hard on that. So you know, I want to thank them for holding our feet to the fire on this but the job is not over we are still there are still very strong powerful voices trying to maintain the status quo and civil society is is absolutely essential in pushing us to be honest to our own analysis and also go slightly further and saying that as academics as experts generally we're very good at looking at the world in silos but we're not going to solve this problem or indeed many of the other ecological challenges we face by thinking like that we need to think at a more systemic level and actually, in some regards, civil society is better at doing that. Society, in general, is better at doing that than we have been as experts. So there is, there is this difficult relationship here between civil society and expertise here. But that combination of the two gives us hope, I think, that we can drive a necessary change. But that hope isn't sitting back and doing nothing. That hope is being out there, either active as a citizen, driving the change, or as academics and as experts, being more honest to our own expertise. On that note, I think we'll, we'll, we'll wrap up this little chat, but is there anything else you'd like to say before we, we turn off the camera? <laughs> um, well, there's a quote that I've used, increasingly using actually, from Gramsci, Gramsci, and it's pessimism of the intellect, optimism of the will. And I think it captures where we are today. When you look at everything around us, when you do the analysis, you can't help but be pessimistic. The optimism comes out of the will, the will to drive change. And that, that is, if you like... Um, hope that emerges from action. And so I think when you combine those two together, that really captures where we are today. Everything tells us, you know, every reason we have to be deeply pessimistic, mm -hmm. but that's no reason to give up. In some, reason that, in some ways, that's a, more of a reason to, to fight harder, and that's the optimism of the will. I guess that's true for many issues, not only climate change. It, it is indeed, yeah. yes. Thank you. Thank you.